Facebook and live on YouTube. Hello, Facebook. Hello, YouTube. Get ready for our VBC Veterans Writers Workshop or panel, I guess we could call it, with Ken Kazak. And I'm going to be sharing my sound here. Oh, and I should make you, I'll make you co-host, uh, Ken, just in case you want to share anything on your own end. You could do so now, since you are now co-host, if you accept my generous offer. Oh, do I have to, uh, yes, do I have to check on something? No, I think it, I think it automatically. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. The new and improved Zoom. New and improved Zoom, exactly. All right, I'm going to let everybody in and start the theme music. And um, it is seven o'clock sharp and John Barber is not here. Oh, John Meyer just, oh man, you were so right, Ken. Here he is. I'll let them all in. All right. everybody and welcome to a special edition of, of our VBC happy hour here on a Thursday night October 7th uh, my name is Todd DePastino and this is the Veterans Breakfast Club and uh, we're doing a special edition it's a writer's panel a writer's workshop with Ken Kazak and I'm very grateful that Ken who's a friend of mine and a writer has agreed to uh, uh, do the spearhead these special sessions with veteran writers to talk about the writing process. You know, we have a slogan here at the Veterans Breakfast Club, which is that every veteran has a story and a corollary to that, or I guess the implied, you know, the implied uh, point of that is that every veteran has a story and that story should be shared. And uh, for a long time, I assumed that this story would be shared orally. And um, I, just in reading really in the past several months, especially reading Jim Roberts book uh, and, and reading Jim Roberts book and talking to Jim about how the experience of that uh, writing that book kind of has helped to bring memories back to him and, and help him get a deeper understanding of his military service. Um, I've really thought that writing is something that, you know, every veteran can do if they have the opportunity to try and put their experiences down in words. And, and I'm very grateful that Ken is uh is the one who's who's spearheading this conversation, and uh, let me let me introduce Ken a little bit. Ken is a writer. He's also a bunch of other things, but he's here tonight because he's a writer, and he has this great book, "How to Be Old." I think this is your latest book, the coolest book with two subtitles: "A Book for the Ages" and "The Title Will Grow on You." Uh, he's also the author of a few other books, including "Under a Cuban Sky." Now, Ken, your alter ego is Matthew Hawkins. Um, so Todd, I, uh, ironically, this is the 20th anniversary of my first trip to Cuba. I've been there 10 times. It was a life changing experience to go there. And, um, before this book came out, I published a book called how the investment business really works. I'm an investment advisor and I didn't know what was going to happen to this book. And I didn't know if anybody was going to, um, you know, frown on me traveling to Cuba in the Got year. Got it. Yes. Yep. So, uh, that makes sense. I thought it was all about that little warning at the bottom of the cover. I don't know if, if people could see that. It says, warning, this book contains strong sexual content and adult subject matter. Maybe that was another reason why you might have wanted to use a pseudonym. Uh, well, not, qu not quite, but, <laughs> but um, as I share with everybody, there's a quote on the back of this book. And the quote is, experience when it cannot be communicated to another must wither within and die and be worse than if lost. And when I was on day 12 of this amazing journey, I said, I can't let these experiences fall apart. And in Santiago, uh, Cuba, I went into a little store and, you know, they don't have much in Cuba, but I bought a uh, pen and a notepad and I just started writing down everything that happened to me. And by the way, that quote, I probably read it when I was 
uh, 15 years old. I never wrote it down. I remembered it forever. And it's attributed to an anonymous uh, German uh, author. So I think here, we sh everybody should be writing their experiences. Can you repeat that quotation slowly so the people could hear it? The quote, the quote is, experience, when it cannot be communicated to another, must wither within and die and be worse than a flossed. In other words, if you can't convey your experiences, it's worse than if you never had them. If you, if, and I think about this, and I'm probably going <clears> to <throat> mention it at, at the end. This would be my exit question. Think about the books that these veterans have written. Their generations going forward will say, oh, my grandfather did this, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather. Part of the permanent record. If you, if you get it down, um, get it down, you know, on in, into a book format. And would you say, and I know I want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, I'm here, I'm the Ellie tonight. I'm really just helping to engineer the production. Ken is, is the host. Um, but would you say that the experience of, the experience of writing your experience of writing your memoir um, kind of changes your relationship to your past and your memory and, you know, enhances it somehow. So when I say I teach writing, I say I teach it from the carthetic aspect and the ancillary benefit. One of the ancillary benefits, your memory is improved because right. of writing. On an ironic note, we just had a group of 78-year-old uh, individuals in Pittsburgh Monday night to play at uh, Heinz Field, right? And I think <laughs> of all these older... Those, and, and I should say those individuals are called, most people know them as the Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones. But you think about the Stones, Springsteen, um, Rod Stewart, whoever, they're, they're always thinking about song lyrics. They've always got these lyrics in the back of their brain. And so if you see, Springsteen doesn't have dementia. He doesn't have decrease in his cognitive ability. So writing one of the great ancillary benefits is your, is your memory is improved. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Let me hand over the the program to you, Ken. And and but, but can I do one more thing though? You shared something else with me that I just can't help but share with people because I just loved it so much. Um, this is uh, is this a, a a kind of a list of recommendations you live by? How to write good? <laughs> it it just crossed my desk one day, and I, I laughed at all of them. So. <laughs> How to write good? Number one: avoid alliteration always. Number two. Prepositions are not words to end sentences with. Number three, avoid cliches like the plague, their old hat. Number four, comparisons are as bad as cliches. Number five, be more or less specific. Number six, writers should never generalize. <laughs> Seven, written out, be consistent. Eight, don't be redundant. Don't use more words than necessary. It's highly superfluous. Number nine, who needs rhetorical questions? Number 10, exaggeration is a billion times worse than understatement. I love it. I think it says it all. Thank you, Ken. Welcome. So by the way, I, I want to share just with the people on the call. One of the reasons I did this, two reasons, I'm always interested in everybody that writes their creative process and their work process. And Todd, I just wanted to give you a night off, you know, because you work hard. <laughs> at the VBC. And I said, boy, maybe I do the heavy lifting here. You said it before, you're, you know, playing the role of Ellie tonight. So. Yeah. I wanted to be a part of it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm interested in the conversation. Well, let's hope that uh, it goes well. And, um, you know, I can share my passion for the written word and, you know, talking to, to Jim and John here that they can, uh, you know, share with us. So um We'll, we'll start with Jim Roberts. Okay. So, and Jim, we've, we've never met. We talked once on the phone, I remember. And, you know, I'm, as I always say, I'm a fan of your bookshelf and your, uh, in, in your poster back there. So um, I have a list of questions. It's really going to be about um, the process of writing and publishing your book. So just, are, are you from Pittsburgh? No. And my, father was, my father was Air Force. So I was born at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Beautiful. So did you come to you came to Pittsburgh after military? Or were you here before uh, you went to the service? No, no. I, I the, the first time I was the second time I was in Pittsburgh was when I flew was when I left for Fort Dix. 
And so we came here in 72. My wife was sent here for, for to finish her education. Okay, cool. So I know that your book is titled it's Mobile Advisory Team 111, and the subtitle is 33 uh, Quebec's Tour of Duty. 33 Quebec was your radio um, call sign. Right? It was the last one. The last the one. Our, okay. The only one I remember. So I know that you uh, were an instructor in college, and when we talked, you had said you had written you know, Buku um, lesson plans. So you were always writing things. But um, this book itself, like when did you first have inception? When did you first think, say to yourself, I'm going to write a book? Uh, well, the guy who's playing engineer tonight, pretending he's Ellie, is the reason I wrote the book. And well, he's just starting. I, I was writing one article for the quarterly newsletter. And Todd asked me to write an article about my return trip from California to Philadelphia after I got out of the service. And so I was just sat down to write that. This was March of the pandemic. Beginning, This was toward the end of March of the pandemic. And as I was writing that story, I was writing it as a short story, another memory popped into my mind. And I made a couple notes and another one popped. So I, I just started writing discrete short stories. And uh, my wife says I disappeared for a year. And by the, when I came back, I had 42 short stories. Uh, oh, and so I, I don't think I ever really sat down and said, I'm going to write a book until I actually had most of the stories done. And I realized there was something here that could be put together. Todd was encouraging, very encouraging with the process, because I, I had two worries as I was writing this and thinking about a book. I was afraid the veterans who read it would laugh at it. And I was afraid the people who are, real, who are writers and, and, and study writing would call it drivel. And, 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 and so I, I had some good support from people like Todd. And that's when I started thinking about actually putting the book together, polishing so, it up, and getting it. Right. So what you're telling me, you started this book in, in essence in March of 2020. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's in, it's published April of 21. Yeah. Took a year. That, that's I'm, I'm impressed with that. Cause I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I, I write slowly. I write slowly. So do you remember when the first time you, Go Are ahead. you impressed with the with the with the, the the length or the shortness of the time it took to write? <laughs> the shortness. Okay. I, me personally, I'm just a, that's uh, you know rapid. So you must uh, well. Let me get back to it in a second there. But so um, when these memories, you said you wrote one article and another memory came back to you, right? So what did you do to capture the creativity? Were you the guy walking around with notepads? Did you have? Uh, Sending yourself text messages. Uh, I, I basically was I was working on a port, working on a computer, a portable computer, and I had a I had a I had a, a, a tech a, a text piece of text software that I would just write write notes in, and a, a different page for each memory that was that was different and thoughts about what to do. So uh, a question I'm always uh, curious about: Did you carve out? You're retired from teaching now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. I, my last class was December 2014. Um, so did you carve out, I, I call it your creative time, like certain days and hours that you were going to just sit there with your notes and your pen and, and uh, work on an outline? Well, Linda and I took care of what we needed to take care of around here, food shopping, taking care of the house and things. If I wasn't doing that, I was writing. I mean, I, um, you know, some, day, some days I would sit down and, and spend the whole day in the chair. And, you know, I would take a couple of weeks off. I would walk away from it for three or four weeks because it was just, it was just, it had been on it too long, but I didn't have like get up and work from eight to 10 every day. I, I didn't have that kind of regimented schedule. And I'm probably the antithesis of the kind of writer you, you, you would like to talk about because in many ways it was a disorganized, it was disorganized because I was writing short stories and, um, and, and, and the, the, the shortest stories, maybe two pages, the longest one's 34. And I think I worked on the 34 page story five or six times because I just didn't, it was too long. I didn't want to write on the same thing forever. So, I see. So were there any other titles that you considered? No. It was no, right there. Uh, well, the original title was Matt 111. And I, I sent the penultimate draft out to 10 people. Uh, uh, Gordon Lamb was one of the readers. Uh, the two guys I was in Vietnam with, some, some, some English teachers and, 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 and people who study rhetoric and, and other people like that. And uh, several of them came back and said, no one knows what Matt 111 is. You got to put Vietnam in the title. If you don't put Vietnam in the title, they, they, you know, they have, if, you, if, you, if you search Matt 111, you get a mathematics book. 
You get mathematics book. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a course called Math 111. Math oh, I see, 111. I see, I see. So then, so we know that your um, structure is a series of 42 stories. Mm -hmm. and you, you call them short stories, essays, what have you, right? I call them stories because I didn't like the idea of chapter. I, 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 I didn't want you to have to read story four to understand story five. Uh, if you didn't like the context or where, or where story four was, you didn't have to read it. You could go to story five. So in that case, there, there, there's a lot of redundancy in the beginning parts where I explain things over and over again. The non-military people said they appreciated that. The military people say it wasn't bad. So I, I did not want to write chapters because to me that implied there was a thread through this where you had to read chapter one to go to chapter two. And that's not the case in this book. So, and, and I think the way you did that is a great way for people to write uh, a book, uh, be it military or, you know, their own experiences in life. But did you outline each story before uh, you wrote it? Were you, were you working ahead? Did you, when, no, story five, I, I, did you know story 10 was going to be? I, I mean, I had a few notes on it, but no. Um, the stories for the most part, to me, the beauty of doing this meant that the timeline was the outline. And so each story had a timeline based on my memory. So I didn't really need to build an outline because I had it as, as what was happening. I mean, we're going on an airmobile assault, you pack, you get on the helicopter, you insert, you do what you're going to do, you get back on the helicopter, you get home. So, 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 so you had a timeline which served as the outline. So I did not work ahead. Like I, I would concentrate on one story, call it finished for that pass and go on to another one. Just, and so, so I worked on all 42 to get them in first draft condition before I went back and started polishing and, 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 and I was reading what people who were reading were saying and, and, and coming back and trying to clean them up. So just, just because I've, uh, I suffer from it constantly. Did you ever have writer's block when you were working on any of the, the no. even the 34 page story? No, nothing no. at all. Beautiful. No. Problem Beautiful. with 34 page story was figuring out what to leave out. There's more there, but, uh, and so, uh, you know, I mean, if day two of the operations like day one, you don't need to describe what you did on day two. Right. Now, um, you know, I'm, I'm always like uh, the, the beginning and the ending. So you said that the beginning was about the article you were writing for VBC magazine, correct? Mm -hmm. And then, but that became the ending of the book. Right. There's Find two more stories after that, that, but that was, that was before I went to Vietnam. Say it again. So there's actually a story 43 and 44, but that one was before, one was before Vietnam and one was after Vietnam. So. I go. So that became the ending of the book itself, right? Um, did even though this is your life, your experiences, did you did you have to um, cite research sources? Did you have to, you know, go to Google, uh, the library, et cetera? Did you call your, um, you know, the the people you serve with and ask them their memory of certain things? Two answers to that. One, I had done a video, I think three years ago, on, on MAT teams. And so it um, turns out that um, working at the Computer Science Department at Carnegie Mellon, we had access to things long before the public did. So for years, I've been searching keywords on, on what was the web. And in the last four or five years, things have started showing up. That's how I found my team captain, strictly by accident. And so um, I did a lot of research for that. I found declassified uh, MACV Military Advisory Command the Military Assistance Command Vietnam uh, annual reports. So I'd already done the research and put a video together. So that wasn't a problem. Oh, I see. I, 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 I'd found my team captain and we established contact. I never lost touch with Gary, White, who's YB in the book. And so they should, in fact, some of their stories are in the book. I, I think I think Rice has two stories and Gary has two or three. Um, and then I found another, uh, another Matt team person who gave me two stories. So they're not all mine. But, uh, but, but I asked them what was going on. So for example, I, we, I talk about the, the whiz wheel in the book. I couldn't remember the name. I could not remember what we called this thing. So I sent all three of these people, what do we call this thing? And wow. I, got, I got three, one, three two word answers, whiz wheel, idiot. So, so, so basically, um, uh, so, so yeah, there was a lot of communication. They read the stories, they offered comments. Uh, for example, the first haircut, my team captain Rice, doesn't remember the electric trimmers. He said they use hand-powered trimmers. He doesn't remember the leather strop. He, he remembers the guy sharpening his hand, his razor on his hand. So, so we don't agree in any means uh, on everything that's in the book. They're my memories and they're how I remember them. And so I don't claim they're accurate or they're what I remember, but we oh, did put the timeline uh, together. Obviously you were in Vietnam long before, uh, you know, 
cell phones, but the, the first off, your pictures are amazing in that book. Is it, are they all your photos? Yeah, they're mine. And some of them are Gary Weinrichs. We share, we shared our, our pictures a, a long time ago. I probably got 400 slides that I've digitized. Wow. Wow. And so you had to go, in essence, you had to edit the photos. Right. Which, well, I, which, I, one of my winter projects was digitizing all my slides because who had a slide projector? And so I was, I was intimately familiar with the pictures that I had. And what, what did you have like the, the little Kodak cameras? I did not carry a camera on operations. I, I, I was too expensive. Um, the artillery unit that was, we had American artillery unit with this 155 millimeter uh, palisers for about four weeks. They had a CH-47 Chinook helicopter, the, the twin rotor helicopter outfitted as a PX. And it landed one day beside the artillery battery. And they let us go in and shop. And I actually bought a 35 millimeter camera there. And Gary bought an eight millimeter, uh, super eight millimeter movie camera. And so a lot of these pictures were taken with a, with a simple range finder. Then for the last two thirds of, the, of it, they were taken with, 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 with a single lens reflex. But none of, the, none of the pictures were taken on operations. Gotcha. Uh, the, that, the one, the one that, photo that Todd showed uh, with you sitting with your weapon, that it, was, it's so clear. It's so, this one right here. Yeah, Gary took that. That's an AK-47. Right. That, oh, sorry. Okay. But the, the clarity of that photo is amazing. Mm -hmm. From a photo taken, what, 50 years ago now? 50, 50 years ago. I was there. I was there this time 50 years ago. Right. So you, you shared with us that um, when you were writing this, you know, you were retired, you and your wife would take care of the house shopping, whatever. But your work area itself, was your work area right there where you're sitting? Only for the editing. Uh, when I was coming down, cleaning things up, formatting, arranging pictures, things like that. Most of the writing was done in an easy chair in the living room or in a, in a comfortable chair on a screen porch in the back once the weather warmed up. And on, on a laptop or you? Um... I, was, I, I, I did the writing on a laptop. I did the editing on a full-size desk, desk iMac. Cool. And by the way, I know you, we talked about, like, as you well know, uh, writing is fatiguing. It, it's, it's draining, right? M mental fatigue is worse than physical fatigue. So were there days that you just said, I'm done, I'm, I gotta get out? I, 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 there were a couple of times I took two weeks off. I just didn't touch it. I just, just put it away and, and didn't, didn't touch it. Uh, you know, I, just, I just felt I needed to get away from it. You know, it wasn't like writer's block or I was sick of it. It's just, you can't keep doing this. And so that had, you know, several times I did that. Right, I, and, and you have to stay in good shape and you have to keep your eyes you know, in, in good shape when you're working on, uh, on projects. So you've already shared that you were, a, you, you wrote this book quickly, but from March of 2020, when did you actually say, I'm done with the first draft, now it's time for editing? How long did that take? Oh, probably through the fall, probably through the fall. So, so the editing, I know you have a unique way to edit. You didn't contact and editor per se, but you had people go through the drafts. I talked with several English professors about hiring them to copy edit the book. The first round of readers, which included Gordon Lamb, who's retired, retired colonel, infantry colonel, several of them said, don't do that. There's a tone to this book. One person really meant a lot to me. He, he could hear my voice telling the stories as if we were sitting in a bar sharing a beer. He said, if you give it to a copy editor, there's a chance they're going to edit the tone out. Live with the errors, live with the mistakes. You know, don't polish it beyond recognition. Try, try to keep the original stories as close as possible to, to the way you wrote them, because that's the way I talk. And that's how I wrote my lecture notes. I, I actually had a comment from, from, from the dean once. He, he did not like my, I put my lecture notes online. He didn't like my lecture notes because they weren't academic enough. Uh, they, they didn't sound like they didn't sound like a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University because I wrote them so the kids would read. In fact, I had an incident where one one of my one of my colleagues walked in and said, "I've got I gave this test. I've got five identical answers to the same question, and there's no way they could cheat." I've asked everyone else, "How did? Can you tell me how they did this?" I read it in my lap. What are you laughing? I said they read my lecture notes. I had explained his question as part of my lecture notes. And so, and so then he went into his class and said, how many of you are reading Roberts's lecture notes? And like two thirds of the class put their hands up. So, so in fact, my last set of lecture notes are still online. Right. Um, just a couple of questions um, uh, to wrap up. And we talked about it before we started the call, but I, I always think about 
for lack of a better term, hyper creativity. When you're immersed in a project, your memory is just firing in all cylinders and you come up with memories and thoughts you hadn't thought about for a long time. And I, I hope that happened to you. I hope you just, you know, were filling your notebook with uh, things that you hadn't thought about in years. I, I saw, I, 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 I listened to a Science Friday program on radio months, maybe years ago. The person's research led him to believe, I don't know if this is accepted in the field, that the best memories are the ones you've never thought of. Every time you remember something, you have to rewrite it in your brain and it gets fuzzier. It's like making a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And each time you do it, memories get fuzzy. That's why when you go back and visit someplace, it doesn't quite look like the way you meant it. So the freshest memories are the ones you haven't thought of in 50 years or 45 years. And a lot of those were that way. The, the, the general, the, the, the specific incident. So, so that's why I think Linda said I went away because I was back there in that part of my brain remembering these things. And, and I think the memories are pretty accurate. I really do. I'm, gl I'm glad you shared that. I never heard that theory, but that makes- uh, I have no idea how valid. makes total, total sense. So, so you have the, the book finished and you have this unique way of getting it edited. But when it comes time to publishing it, um, like who did your book layout for you? Did you have to go through the process of like, here's your font and everything like that? I bought a book on Amazon from a guy who's got 15 books self-published. I read it judiciously. I wrote the first draft following his rules. I looked at, well, I looked at the Amazon software right now and his book was totally worthless. And it was just released two years ago. The Amazon software for putting your book together and your ebook, which are two totally different operations, right. is in my mind, some of the best software I've ever used. Uh, I only had one question. I, I went online, I had a choice of chat or phone call. I clicked phone call and I was trying to figure out what to do with the next four hours and my phone rang. And they said, do this and it worked. And so the software is just incredible. You need to feed, you basically need to give, uh, you can work out a P PDF uh, on, the hard, on the book. You download the Kindle version and you put a text file in it. You go through and tag your chapter titles and it does all the work for you. Uh, I chose one of their, uh, one of their uh, cover layouts because I could not ensure I could get the spine text where it had to be. Right. And it let me pick the picture. It, it, it gave, I didn't like the font. The, my favorite font is the font on the actual printed title page, which is a stencil like the military uses, but I, I could live with it. So I used everything in house from Amazon and I found it to be not at all a painful experience. Now again, I'm 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 I, I'm a fairly I'm a fairly experienced computer user, so I, I don't know how fair that would be. But but I, I again for all the software I've used over the years and how bad it's been, this was not at all bad. It was it was reasonable to use. I, I listen. I love. I had a layout person, but but I uh, in a design person. I think the Amazon KDP program is amazing for anybody that writes. So your book's back there over your left shoulder. It's a six by nine book. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> the first thing, if you'd use Amazon, the first thing you do when you write the book is choose the book size because you want to have the margin set. Because if you don't, then all your pictures are in the wrong place and everything like that. So you choose the size of the book you want, set your margins, and it saves you a lot of work. And, and so this is six by nine. I actually bought, when I got back to Vietnam, I, I was buying all the books that were being written and reading them. I still have a bunch of them and I have some of the newer ones here. And a lot of them are this format. It seems to be a pretty much a standard format. And did you get, um, get that? We'll ask uh, anybody that writes. Did you get um, publicity, newspaper articles? Were there uh, radio interviews? Is it no, just not really. And Self publishing is not. Todd can speak better to this than I can. Uh, the information I have, I've got from him, Todd. What do you have to say? I think there's no chance in the world this would be reviewed by the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Um, <clears throat> my understanding is no. It's it, newspapers, magazines generally don't review self-published books and that's really the the only well there are a couple other but that's the major downside to self-publishing is that you don't get reviewed in major mainstream publications but that's increasingly um becoming untrue in the sense that there are increasing publications who at least online like the vva magazine they will review uh, self-published works, but only online, I believe. I don't think they do that in their paper print version. I don't, I don't know, but, but I sent them the book today. So they said they would review it. I just, I just asked the question because, you know, uh, we, we have to put forth some marketing effort to do it. And I was just curious as to what you did. Um, one last question and one comment for you, Jim. 
you had mentioned on one of our calls that we had that Barnes and Noble has uh, will will um, uh, list an Amazon book, or if somebody went into Barnes and Noble, they could buy your book through the bookstore. Is that correct? They could order it. They could order. It. I mean, if you go to Barnes and Noble and just search for my book, my full name, right. it'll show up, and 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 you can get it through Barnes and Noble from Amazon. I, I just I never believe did that. Barnes and Noble will order it for you through Amazon if you want to. Okay. It. Well, so, listen, we're going to have one last question at the end, but I just want to make one comment. I, I, I like the chapter, uh, hope I have the title, right? I don't talk to lizards. Right. So um, right. I would tell anybody when you read Jim's book, um, you're, you're going to smile when you read about the, the lizard king. So if you Google the name of that lizard as it's written in the chapter, you can actually find it on Google. There's multiple listings of it. Turns out it's in a lot of Southeast Asia. Cool, so, cool. You know. Can I make one comment? Sure, please. And, and that is that one of the reasons, what I've been telling people is that you want to write this, whether you publish it or not, and, and you, you want to write this down, not for you and not for your kids, but for your grandkids and your great grandkids. This is all, I, this is about all I have left of my dad. This is him standing under a B-17 in North Africa. That's all I know. Uh, I know what he did from the time I could remember him until I left home. I don't know what he did the 30 years before he we went in the, air, in, in, in the Air Force, except he worked in the mines for a few years. And so he's a two-dimensional figure in my mind. I just don't know him. If you want your future family to understand more about you, they need to be able to read something. And, and if you don't type, you can talk. You can record it. And you can, you can maybe have someone type it or, or you can dictate. But you want to just talk to them. You don't want to try to write Hemingway. You just want to tell stories about what you did and, and put it down so people 50, 70 years from now will have a picture of who you are. And you're not just a flat two-dimensional service in a scrapbook with maybe your name underneath it. The other thing is, uh, I'm going to blow my horn, own horn here. The royalties are going to Todd and the Vector, Veterans Breakfast Club. So buy the book, advertise the book, <laughs> get the sales up. Because last book, I think last month we sold three books. So, And I just got a royalty check today. From Jim Roberts. Thank you. And you know what hurts, Jim, is it's more than many royalty checks I've gotten uh, for my own writing. My that that kind of like hurts. A pretty puny, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I want to say Thomas Grineau. Hello, Thomas. How are you? Thank you for joining us. I, I know that Tom Stein, Thomas Grineau, um, Leo West are all veterans and they're all have all written. And um, and I hope they'll chime in. Uh, Leo, uh, Thomas put in the chat here that uh oh you said you'd like to chime in uh thomas put in the chat that dod reads is another site to advertise your book so dod reads thomas they um they will review self-published books that's correct what it is todd is um you can fill out like this goes to robert and everyone else on the panel here uh contact this website called dod reads i was just certain one day and uh, it's a kind of a private site, I guess you could say, but the gentleman will review your book and then it, he'll elect to review your book, I should say. But if he doesn't, you, he'll give you an option where you can fill out like this form to do a uh, author's, uh, like a questionnaire, kind of like this panel is. And he'll feature your name and the questions he asks you. And then what he'll do is you can, uh, I paid like a like a hundred bucks, I think it was, or two hundred bucks. But it he'll put an advertising uh, link, and it'll go to Amazon wherever you sell your book to the pub, and uh, it's good for like say twenty or thirty thousand reviews. And it did help me. I will say that it really did. Um, and when Robert was saying about how Barnes and Noble, he's absolutely right. It, it for a self publisher, it is very hard to get your book to be featured in the store. I, I had the same thing too, where, you know, you can walk up to the counter, tell them who you are and they'll say, yeah, we can order your book. We have in our distribution center. However, I will note this weekend, Todd, I, I, I had luck on my side that uh, I went into a Barnes and Noble store, one of the larger ones in the city I live in. And uh, the gentleman uh, said like, uh, he goes, Hey, I like promoting local authors. I'm going to order about four or five copies of your book and put them on the shelf. So that helped me quite a bit, but um, it, is, it is hard to get started, like Robert said, 
And when you self-publish, it's all word of mouth. First is going to be word of mouth, your friends, your family, social media. And that's how you really get the momentum of your book to really take off. It takes a little while. It, it goes up and down. Uh, you'll see your ratings and everything. And, and it's addicting because you'll be on the line all day looking to say, all right, I'm in the top 100. No, I'm not a top 100. But he's Robert's absolutely right. It's it, it, it's a challenge. One of, the, one of the things I did was I made business cards about the book. Yep. And I also sent postcards. I went down my mailing list, my Christmas card yeah. list, my contact list, and mailed postcards out to everyone, which just had the cover and the back cover on there and saying, buy this. It, the money goes to a good organization. And another thing I want to say what is a, is, a, is a good thing for all the people that are trying to write a book for advertising is uh, bookmarkers. Because everyone needs a bookmarker. And believe, yep, Robert, Robert got right, his right there. And I tell you what, those are the, one of the best things that you can give a person. And attend local, like, veterans events, like parades or air shows. Because, in fact, I'll be at an air show this weekend uh, with another uh, well-known author. Uh, but uh, that's going to get my book promoted. And uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to promote it. And, you know, like Robert said, when you self-publish, uh, it's you're not going to be like the big names because they have they pay for that. They got the agents, the publishers pay for all that. But when you self-publish, you are your own advertising agent. You're everything wrapped into one. Thomas, I have a, I have a question. When you get it, yeah. when someone buys your book through Barnes and Noble. Right. The, the, the their Barnes and Noble revenue comes out of your side, I assume. Or is the book now, sold at a higher price? No, believe it or not, if, if, see, I, I had a publisher do, uh, you know, I went through a publisher with my book, but however, I still own the, I still own the copyright. So that's a little different compared to like, you know, like the big name authors where they sell it but, and they get royalties. Excuse me. Whereas this one, I still own the copyright where I get a little bit more royalty out of it. So if it goes to Barnes and Noble, believe it or not, you make less because there's such a huge volume, but, and, and you would think because Amazon is your largest, uh, I guess you could say platform to sell books, but you, I make more off an Amazon sale than I do a Barnes and Noble. Well, sure. Because I think, I think maybe, maybe Amazon has a deal with Barnes and Noble where they're, they're giving their portion of the revenue. Jim might know this better, but he, oh, he's a Barnes yeah. and Noble. Yeah, since I just did this, um, I mean, basically, what what they do is they have a fixed formula for how much it costs to print the book yes. based on the book size yeah. and the number of pages. At that point, they want that for every book. You can't you pick the price, and they give you sixty percent. They take forty, and so uh, people who are coming in from a business side buy it cheaper, and that's why your money goes down. And and so and 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 so 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 basically. Uh, they're not going to pay the full release price for the book because they're making a markup on it. And so Amazon's still going to take their cost of printing it out and take whatever's left and split it 60, 40, as far as that. And, and one thing too, you got to, you got to remember too, uh, Ken and, and, and Todd is that you're never going to get rich writing a book. You're not going to be a millionaire. You're not going to be, you know, some buku bucks over it. You, you, you make enough to basically cover your, uh, publishing costs are your first expenses that you'll do then the rest you know like i i take my royalties and i buy it back into books and then what i do is if i'm at uh events and i know someone that has a lot of connections you give them a copy of your book and then they start telling people about your book and then they buy it so that's another thing that you, you know that you you got to tell authors to do is is you, know, you don't need to go buy thousands of copies, just buy like say 10 or 20. And then when you're at a big function, give some out here or there. And it's just word of mouth that spreads. And that's another way of promoting your book is, is, is to do that as well. Okay. Uh, Todd, um, we're gonna go on to uh, uh, John Barber next. Is John still on the call? He just sat down, I saw him there, so. John, don't hey, John. leave the room. <laughs> yeah, no. Don't leave the room, John. Oh, 
Muted. We have to ask John to unmute. There, there we go. Oh, I oh, I'm sorry, John. Yeah, I'm gonna have to ask to unmute you again. Okay. Okay. There you go. Hi, John. How are you? Good. Hi, John. How are you? There's another book. I mean, John and Jim, and I'm gonna shut up, I promise. You know, these are books with not necessarily like narrative arcs, you know, um that you, you build to like one big event and then there's a denouement and all that stuff. Um, and I think if you had done that, it, I would have, it would have lost something on me. And I've read a recent book that built toward a narrative arc and it's like, everything is sacrificed to the arc. So me as a historian, I want to know about your everyday life. I want to know about the details of what it's like to dig a foxhole. You know, I don't care about your, <laughs> don't take it personally, John or Jim, but I don't care about your narrative arc. I, I, you know, I care about your lived everyday experience and man, that's what you, your books deliver in a way that rarely does history deliver them as well as you did. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a writer. I don't have anything published, but uh, I just uh, ex expressed myself uh, in the book and what I did uh, growing up in, in Vietnam. So, so um, John and Todd and everybody on the call, when this idea came up, you know, John was my number two guy that I wanted on here. So, John, I appreciate you coming on here. We did meet in Aliquippa. You know, I have many cousins in Aliquippa. I know you uh, at one time worked with my cousins, but your book just floored me. You told me about it when we were at the coffee shop there in Quippa. Oh, and okay. I came back and I read it. I couldn't stop reading it. I read it online. Uh, I probably, we met on a Saturday morning. I had the book finished by Wednesday. And I, just to give, uh, uh, you know, concrete evidence to what Todd was saying, your framing of this book is absolutely amazing. How you started writing your book, going into the Marines, and then you went back to your childhood, which was yeah. not, uh, you know, which was challenging. I Again, I, I appreciate you sharing all that, and then you went forward, but let me get through my questions and then, you know, sure. bring up my compliments to you here. So, um, and you were in Vietnam relatively early, correct? 66, 67. Yeah. Right. Okay. So then you're back in California and you're back in Washington, PA, and you're back in, uh, El Equipa. But when did you get inception? When did you say, Hey, I want to write a book? Well, my, uh, two brothers and sisters, they always wanted to know what I did in Vietnam. And I told them that uh, if I get drunk enough, I'll tell you. And uh, I met a guy online and he wrote a book about Vietnam. And he said, I said, when were you there? He says, well, I was never in Vietnam. I said, well, how did you write a book about it? He said, people told me stories and I wrote it down, put it in a book. And I said, I've always wanted to do that. And he said, well, just sit down and start writing. I sat down. I didn't get up for eight, nine months. It just, it just poured out of me. Right. So, so my idea of having a set time and hours to write, uh, like Jim, you didn't have to do that. I, I, wrote, I, I wrote at work. I wrote at three o'clock in the morning. I'd be sleeping. I'd be thinking, of, oh, yeah, I can write. I'd get up write that down. Everything was handwritten. So that's okay. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks for asking me that. But then who, who typed it, who put it together for you then? Uh, my daughter helped me a lot. You know, okay. I, 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 I would, uh, she would say, you know, you know, you, or you already said that, take that out, you know? So she kind of helped me, uh, write it. And by the way, cause I read your book a second time. You, one of your daughters has the same birthday as you. Was that the one that helped you do it? Uh, no, it's my older daughter. Your old daughter. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, anybody on this call now should be a fan of uh, a record for a heavyweight. Great title. Where did you get your title from? Well, there was a uh, college uh, professor. Uh, he was kind of helping me write it. And uh, 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 he wrote a book uh, about it. his son was uh, got killed in Vietnam. And uh, he came up with the title uh, 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 Vietnam Requiem. And uh, I, I, I stuck with that. So, so how much, like, was there a, a set outline? Because again, it's such a unique book, the framing of it. It reminded me of a Quentin Tarantino movie. 
going back and forth. So was there a set outline? Uh, not really. I, I just, I just started uh, uh, when I was in, uh, in, in the boot camp and went from there. And then, uh, you know, I, I read a lot of books about Vietnam and uh, that kind of helped me a little bit uh, with the framing of the book. And uh, I had to write about my childhood uh, because I think I had it better in Vietnam than I did growing up. Yes. Yes. And, I mean, you, you made that comment a few times in the book. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, just, I, I just, I just wanted people to uh, feel what I felt when I was there. And, and you did, you, you did that. Um, Jim made a comment that he stood up and walked away from his um, book at one point in time. Did that ever happen to you? Did you just say, Oh, it's just too difficult. I'm going to go golf or I got to get away from this for a weekend. Anything like that? Uh, maybe a, not really, not really. I mean, there's a lot of tears went into this book. And uh, not, I, I just kept writing and writing and writing. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Did, did you, even though it's your memory, your stories, did you have to research anything? Did you have to contact anybody? Did you go onto Google and say, um, well, this is, this is the first town I was in. Did you have to, you know, no, go? everything was, everything was in my head. Did, just, just, just amazing. So, on timing now, from the idea that you were going to write this book till, let's say, the longhand version, how long did that take to do? Oh, gosh. Uh, four or five years, maybe. Right. So that's, that's, more, that's more my speed than Jim, uh, you know, yeah, six yeah. months ago to, 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 to get it down. So I, I um, would write a section and I say, oh, yeah, that belongs in this section. So I have to rewrite it. But uh, you know, it, it it took it took a long time. Wow! I'll never I'll never do that again. Well, that's by the way, that's going to be a, a, a an end question here about that. But what what was going on in your life? Were you already retired, or did you start it when you were still working? Oh, I started when I was still working. I started maybe uh, ninety eight, nineteen ninety eight, around two thousand, something like that. Wow! And. Always interested in people's work areas. Did you tend to work in the same desk at the same table? At uh... well, I worked at the airport, so I work in the I work in the, uh, the lounge area. I'd work when I was eating. I mean, I, I would write when I was eating. Uh, uh, I would be offloading airplanes, and, and things would come in my head, and I'd have to I have to write it down real quick, and then put it back in my pocket and go on with my work and. Oh man. So all this was long handed and you just like, you gave your daughter a bunch of, of like this and to say, type this up. Is that, oh, yeah. that ended up happening? Oh wow. yeah. Yeah. So, but this side question, I know you uh, shared letters home in your book. Yeah. Um, what, what, what is the, uh, I know when you go into the first day of boot camp, aren't you, don't you have to write a letter home? Is that uh, a requirement? I think you have to write a letter saying how, how you love it. And, uh, it's, it's the right place for me. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, everything's okay. You know, everything's fine. Right. You know? No, it just seems that like the military wants you to write home. It's, um, yeah. Oh, they, oh yeah. They, they definitely want you to write home. Yeah. You right. still have to. Right. But anyway, your, your, uh, your, your recall was absolutely tremendous. If you don't mind me saying on the second time, I read it. I had forgotten about the, the uh, your fellow soldier who got the butterfingers from home. Oh yeah, and he had to eat all of them. Yeah, <laughs> I, just, I didn't. Re I don't remember that from my uh, first read. Um, refresh my memory. You went to a speeded up boot camp. You were in eight to nine weeks. Yes. In regular boot camp is what 14, 16? Usually, usually uh, twelve to fourteen weeks. Yeah. Okay, so, so they had to get more soldiers in country. That's why they speeded you yeah. up. Yeah, you're right. Wow, wow. Um, and also, too, you went over to Vietnam on a ship. So at, well, I don't know, 1968 or 69, they started flying people over, correct? Yeah, we were the last uh, division to go over as a division uh, aboard ship. Right. Yeah, went to Hawaii, then Okinawa, spent three months in Okinawa, got guerrilla warfare training, and then to Vietnam. Wow. And if you don't mind, I, I just have to ask you a couple questions before the actual um, public 
publishing of your book. But in, in again, I'll tell you why one of the things that jumped out at me, you started talking about Mary Ellen at different parts early in the book, but we didn't meet her until page 80. Now, did this college professor <laughs> give you that idea or did you just come up with that idea on your own? I, I, I just come up with my own. Oh. Yeah. Man, and I, I tell you, that's that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant stuff there. Um, again, people don't, I hope everyone's gonna read, you know, Jim's book and uh, John and John's books, but, uh, you know, if you don't mind me sharing, you found a, when you were in a, living in Hawaii as a kid, yeah. a Japanese bomb was in your backyard? Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was next to a church we went to. And we, as little kids, we were playing around. We found this thing back there half stuck in the ground and we didn't know what it was. We called the fire department and it was a, it was a bomb. They, they, they dropped it. Was that, was that semi-common in Hawaii in what, that would have been what early sixties, I assume. Oh, that was uh, in the fifties. In the fifties. Okay. Yeah. So 10 years plus after uh, Pearl Harbor, there's a Japanese bomb. Just oh yeah. So um, but listen, I, I have to tell you too, just the, when you wrote chapter four, battling the memories, I, that, that was tough to read, but I, I read it twice and I'll, I'll just tell you, you know, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing oh, yeah. That, uh, yeah. that time. So your daughter comes back with typed pages. Who did you, did you get, um, did you use the Jim Roberts editing method or did you go to your college friend and to edit I, the book? Nothing is edited and nothing was published. It's just, it's just on the internet. Well, I mean, I'm even going back to like typos and, uh, you know, grammar, punctuation issues in like awkward language. Yeah, yeah. Um, like did someone go through that and said, hey, you, you misspelled this word? Did anybody do that? But my daughter did that. Okay. Because it's a clean manuscript. It's clean. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I could have used better words maybe, you know? I don't think so. I don't think so. No. And this, this, uh, this author from Florida, she told me, how come... How come you don't use uh, the word uh, F U C K? How come you hit, how come you don't use that word? And I said I don't remember saying anything like that, but I put it in there a couple of times, you know. Right. Uh, um, and but just I just to share with the people on the call tonight when you were going back for your second um, tour of duty. Right. You met Pete whose mom was the actress, Gail Storm. Yeah, at we were at, yeah, we were in San Bernardino going back for my second tour and he was going for his first tour. And I, the night before Pete and I went out and had a few drinks and uh, the next day we met in the, uh, in the hangar and he said, would you like to meet my mother? And I said, yeah, when I turned around here was Gail Storm. And uh, you know, Gail Storm, she's a movie actress and uh, she says, oh, please take care of my son for you. I, I said, oh, he'll be fine. He, he'll, he'll be all right. Years later, uh, I, get a, I get a phone call from, from Gail Storm. You know, I sent her the, the, the book. And uh, she says, well, how come my picture's not in it? And I said, you didn't give me permission. <laughs> so she sent me a bunch of pictures. So I had a find a way to put that in there you know that that was just um, i know that was she called you um so uh now the way the book is published uh, um is it was it just a bbc publishing is it just on the internet it's just on the internet it's not even published yeah i don't have any there's nothing published it's not self-published or anything but like what's the program you used or i got to ask i don't know did todd help you with that is that I, I just typed it out and, and uh, uh, Todd, uh, who was um, Kevin Farkas? Kevin, Kevin Farkas, Farkas, yeah, helped you format it a bit yes. and, and put it up on the social voice. He did. He did a lot. Right. I right. see. Listen, um, I'm, I'm, I'm to this anybody on this call right now. This is a book I've read twice, and just John's um, formatting of his book is 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 classic. I'm telling you, I. Uh, I wasn't kidding around when I was like said it was a Quentin Tarantino movie. I mean, it's just the, the way you go back and forth is beautiful and um, everything else. And I, I appreciate you sharing all your personal uh, yeah, stories there's, there. there. 
there's a lot of pictures in there from uh, Time Magazine, though. You know, I have a lot of pictures in there, but Time Magazine also has, I have a few pictures from Time Magazine in there. So I don't know if I can publish that or not. What was the name of that? What was the name of that one photographer who took your picture? Larry, Larry Burroughs. Yes. With your picture with your. Um... With my there's like five or six guys standing together. Yes. Yes. It's called a praying picture. It, it, uh, absolutely. So now, listen, I called I called his son, Larry. Uh, uh, I can't think of his son's name right now in New York. And he said, I can go ahead and put that picture in, in the book. Mm -hmm. So I did that. So listen, I, I just want to thank you for coming on to this uh, presentation tonight. You know, you were my number two person there. So thank you so much. Well, thanks and, for having me. I might be seeing my cousin from El Equipa this weekend, uh, who you used to work with. So oh, okay. Right. We'll be at the Serbian church. All right. Nice talking to you. Don, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Todd. How we doing, Todd? Uh, we're doing fine. We're doing very good. How is John uh, Meyer doing? Hey, John, thank you for joining us. Yes, sir. I'm off of mute, ready to roll. All right. <laughs> thank you so much. Cool. So, um, John, you're you're not a you didn't write a book. You've written books. If I have it uh, tabulated, you're you, you have three books. Yes, sir. That you've written. Perfect. And so, um, and you're also a. Um, writer per se, you actually, you were a college student that, that wrote for the school newspaper. Right. And uh, uh, <laughs> you see that book right there on the end, you know, earlier you mentioned your 20th anniversary. That picture there is 53 years ago anniversary. It was October 6th. That picture was taken for Across the Fence. And then today is the 53rd anniversary of my first major firefight in Laos for four hours. We were down to our last bullets. We came out and uh, we were able to get out of there. And uh, that was that experience that triggered us. I said, God, this story, but we couldn't talk about it. We had signed non-disclosure uh, agreements for 20 years. And so now we can finally write about it. And uh, that was my first book. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted to link with you. Today was your 20th anniversary. This is my uh, 53rd on a major day in my life. Wow. And by the way, just as a, if, if Amazon is telling me the truth on um, Saturday, it'll be four years that uh, the Saul Chronicles have been published. Yes. Right. They have a, they have a publishing date of 10, nine, 2017. So, so here you are. So, so you grew up in New Jersey. Do I have that right? Yes, sir. That's uh, that's East of Pittsburgh. Very far, <laughs> yes, very, very, far, very east of Pittsburgh. And so you were just like typical high school kid hanging out, playing football and all the good stuff there. Just Yeah, just grew up in a milk truck, went to college for two years, wasn't serious about it, finally flunked out, and then read the book, The Green Berets, knowing I was going to get drafted. And I said, oh, if I can go with these guys, I'll get more training. And so I enlisted for three years, and uh, the rest is history. Got in got through the training, went to Vietnam. And then uh, at the end of our in-country training in May of 68, a little guy comes out and says, we're looking for volunteers. And Johnny McIntyre, my buddy, goes, for what, Sarge? He says, sorry, we can't say. Either you're in or you're out. Two days later, we all volunteered, went to Da Nang, and then we signed a non-disclosure agreement. And that, that was our entrance and introduction to the secret war in Laos and Cambodia. So I, I got two quick questions. First off, sure. The book, the book, the Green Beret. Is that the, the movie, the Green Beret, and the book are different? They're no, there's this. Uh, well, they they based the book off. Uh, I mean, they they based the movie off of the book, and because uh, you know initially John Wayne had wanted to do a documentary, uh -huh. but the army there's a lot of friction even to this day between the army and special operations, so the army wouldn't cooperate. So John Wayne just said, "Okay, I'll do it my own way," and he did. And he, he did work with Robin Moore, who wrote the book. And that led to the movie that came out, I think, 67, 68. And, and in I fact, just the first I, time I, I saw the movie, I, I was in the Trang at the end of our training. And we saw the movie, The Green Berets, for the first time. I've never seen the movie. I've never heard any great. It's, it's not. 
you know. It's not, it has some good sections that are really down to earth that right. talk about the real thing. Other things, you know, it's a little bit of Hollywood in there, but the basic story is a story of our, especially with working with indigenous troops. In our case, um, we had the secret war across the fence in Laos and Cambodia. And again, I'm alive today, thanks to the South Vietnamese that are on our team. And so my writing, I was in my junior high school newspaper in high school. They had all these kids that were the elite of the school. They wouldn't let a little milkman son in. And then when I came back from Vietnam, I got involved with a, a, a school newspaper, was the editor for a couple of years. My writing wasn't that strong. And then I went to a newspaper in Trenton Times, worked there for 10 years, San Diego County for a total of 15 years. And then since 2008, I've been working with helping veterans get affordable housing until January when I moved to Tennessee. Um, and we're focusing on a podcast with Jocko. Right. We're doing individual uh, podcast. Well, first, I don't just say this lightly, but you do have a certain Hemingway quality to your writing, the short, shorter uh, descriptive uh, sentences. So I have to go back now. So sure. when, when did you first hear? Okay, you're going to be Military Assistance Command Vietnam. Like when they put you in that room, go in this room. We can't tell you what it's going to be, but go in there. Correct? Right. So did they, was it known by that name then? Uh, yes, it was known by that name. But again, nobody talked about it publicly. Everything was hush hush. So we go in, we, we do the briefing, we sign the non disclosure yes. agreements. And but, but the odd thing is, tell your mother. I know, but you're saying like, hey, we're at war, we're in a war, sign this, don't talk about it. Did you have any clue that it would be Laos and Cambodia that you would be no. involved with? No, okay. when we had gone through training group, uh, special forces training, that we had men who had been there two or three times. And they said, when you go to Vietnam, just get on a regular A team, which is tough duty. I said, but don't do these projects. People die there. So when we get there, the movie's playing, they come out for special projects. We go like, hey, we're in, man. Let's try it. <laughs> and I, um, and I'll, I'll butt in to say that uh, SOG stood for Studies and Observations Group. Correct. So they it was did that kinda... because of snoopy ass reporters. Uh, <laughs> initially, they called it the Special Operations Group. They said, oh, this is going to get us in trouble with you know, the press. So then they called it that. And then the media just went across it. The whole budget was hidden in the Navy budget for the sequel war. Yeah, studies You're and observation right. sounds like a bunch of nerds doing, yeah. you know, technical work. Studying fawns and, and Ferna. <laughs> so your, your, your first book was Across the Fence, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and so um, um, you, that started, if I remember correctly, in college. No, wait a second. You were in college in the early 70s. Correct. Your professor said, why don't you write a book? And you said, I'm not allowed. Is that, in essence, yeah. what happened? Yeah, and uh, I, around about 87, I started uh, doing a, a couple articles for Soldier of Fortune using a nom de gerre. Right. And then uh, I went, through, you know, I went through a divorce, got remarried, and my wife, at the, uh, the, my woman I remarried, I mean married the second time for a second marriage, she had two boys, they had two girls, so we had four teenagers in the house and a newborn. And she says, write the book, because the kids have got to see this someday. Oh, amazing. Amazing. And so earlier you're talking to uh, Jim or a couple of other guys about how they wrote and where I started in the living room. We had a computer set up there, moved to the garage. And then ultimately I moved to, uh, to one of the bedrooms upstairs. Uh, and of course I was working full time in the newspaper. We had the five children. So things were a little bit busy. Did anybody break that non-disclosure? Like it's, did, did, uh, did you, was there a book by Joe Smith and you started reading and go, oh, Joe's really my friend Larry. Did there's <laughs> anybody break the code? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Not to, um, okay. okay. There may have been, a uh, if there were, I'm not aware of it. David Maurer did a fiction book called The Dying Place, which was the first major well-written book on the secret war. Okay. And that came out, I forget what year, a long time ago. So, so across the fence, as I, if I understand correctly, it's been um, edited. I mean, not edited, revised two different times. Uh, uh, we revised it once. Uh, it initially came out around 2003. And then we had the expanded edition. We added three chapters, 50 plus photographs. And I expanded a couple of the uh, 
indexes and things like that in the in the uh, book. Okay, so then the second book, and I, the, the one question I'm dying to ask you is this: yeah. is on the ground. The second, okay. book. yes, sir. So by the time you did that, were you? Did you have one writing spot, a desk? With yes, I had. And- uh, by that time, both of our boys had uh, matured. They were out of the house, so I took over the boys' bedroom, and that was my office until we moved uh, to Tennessee uh, in January. And that's across the fence. The first book, but and right. That, so, oh, but on on the ground, and um, the other book I'll mention in a second. You did those in California. Yeah, all three books I wrote there. Yes, in California. And, uh, okay. But John here's the Peters question. is my co-author for On the Ground. We served together in Vietnam. And here's what my question is: The yeah. co-author John Peters has a degree in philosophy. There must have been some <laughs> phenomenal conversations, theoretical, yeah. right? Right. And John's one of these, he's scary bright and he's a great writer. So um, a lot of the writing uh, finessing that you read there, I give credit to John on on a lot of that. He's just a great writer. And uh, that was the creative process at the time. And that's me standing in front of our clubhouse at FOB1, where we were first stationed for the first seven months during the war. Right. Uh, I I don't mind sharing this with you, but when I, who was the person that I think it was a medic that picked up the Swedish K machine gun and, <laughs> and it, it went off and you're in a, you're in barracks. It was, it was a room. I, it was a room, that, my room with Spider Parks and Don Wilkins. So we were the three Americans from uh, Idaho, from our recon team. And the medic who has to remain uh, nameless because <laughs> I promised him I wouldn't use his name, but he came in. Yes, he picked it up. And as it fired from an open bolt and he had gone through medics training and he came in country, he forgot it was an open bolt weapon. So he just pulled the trigger and, and fired off several rounds. <laughs> and then he came back and did the same thing with another weapon two months later. So like, I know, time, when, I know when you were on the VBC call before and Todd just flashed a picture like you, yeah. you could like the Swedish machine gun was not issued by the U S army. Correct. Correct. In the early days of the secret war, from 60, they began, the secret war officially began in 64. And so by the time I got there in 68, the war had been going on for four years. But in the early days, the Swedish K, Sten guns, um, sometimes they have a Thompson submachine gun. But then uh, by my time, they came out with a CAR-15, which was a modified M16. It was shorter and it had a collapsible stock, which is perfect for jungle fighting. And so those are that was a preferred weapon, and then we also carried a, a sawed-off grenade launcher. So I'm I'm also too like, did you set file off your serial numbers on the weapons? Did I? No, no. No, some guys did. I didn't. I figured okay, they that wasn't that wasn't required. Dead, they get my gun. I'm not going to worry about. It. I'll be dead by then. Right. So now, now coming forward, the book. This uh, is it proper to say SOG? Yes, sir. S-O-G. Sure. Salt yeah, that's, that's our acronym. That's okay. now, thanks to the podcast, it's, it's growing uh, in public knowledge now. Beautiful. So the book itself, Saul Chronicles, is volume one, subtitled Operation Tailwind. Correct. Yes, sir. And that was okay. the third book. So that's the book with the anniversary will be on Saturday, four years since you published it. Thanks right? for putting that. I didn't even... <laughs> we've been so Happy busy. Happy anniversary. Okay. <laughs> so, so now... So, so the Saul Chronicles, though, what's different from one and two? Like, is it? Um... Well, so volume two has is right here now. It's it's stuck in my little my little head. <laughs> we haven't gotten it out. We've been, we've been doing. Um, Jocko has has uh, helped me put up Sogcast, where I've interviewed uh, twelve Sog soldiers. We're going to be interviewing more, and they've been put up in a separate. Uh, separately on uh, Spotify and Apple. Right. And those stories, those interviews, in fact, we just did number eight, which is Mike Rose, who received the Medal of Honor. And we have that story in Saw Chronicles. Is that the name of your podcast, Saw Chronicles? Uh, no, it's called Saw Cast. Like uh, C-A-S-T? Uh, yes, sir. And Sog all cast. the word, capital S-O-G, capital C, then cast. If you go to Spotify or Apple, they'll pop up. Right. By the way, just because I'm, I'm, I'm relatively new to podcast and there's Me one too. I listen to 
that the gentleman, he's got major advertisers. He's very successful. He was one of the first podcasters. Any advertisers yet? Uh, no, uh, Jocko is, uh, I do the recordings and turn anything over to Jocko and his staff. Then they post them. And okay. so Jocko is on the receiving end because people from the podcast, we have continued book sales that are generated by each uh, podcast. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Gotcha. So it's like a quid pro quo. And I, you know, I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to get our guys' right. stories out there. And Jocko has been very supportive. So, so as a journalism student yeah. and a newspaper writer, uh, I'm hoping you're going to answer yes. Did you have a really finite outline before you started the book? Did you really like work on your outline over and over again before you started writing? Only, no, uh, only on the third book that I have an outline. And it was very vague mm -hmm. because um, my, somebody, you know, like if both books, the first book and the second book, the best stories in there aren't mine. There are other Green Berets that came up against, like, for example, on October 5th, 53 years ago, we had a nine-man team that came up against 10,000 NVA. And three of our guys were killed. They had 9,000 casualties based off of the combat Whoa. from our air support and the yes. team on the ground. So those kind of stories. Um, and like chapter four is the story of John Walton, who's the son of Sam Walton from Walmart. Sure. And we don't put that in the book. But um, he's just an incredible medic. But his story, he had a, one of his teammates had his leg blown off by friendly fire. And John brought him back. Another teammate was shot four times. And John brought him back all on the same day, the same mission. Wow. So then how about edit? Did you have an editor per se? Oh, no, yes. You? Yes. Um, the Across the Fence was printed by Real War Stories. And Dennis Cummings and... Uh, uh, Lisa Allen were the co-founders of Real War Stories. They printed our books and they really stuck with what we wanted to write. And, uh, and that was true with the second book. Lisa was the, our copy editor on that. She was familiar with special forces from uh, reading of books and, and interviewing me before she actually began to edit because she really got the terminologies down. And then for the, uh, the second book, they couldn't find a printer. So we had to get another printer for Saw Chronicles. My daughter was the editor, a copy editor. And uh, she was very anal, but she's a great copy editor. She did a copy editing course, became a certified copy editor out of New York City. She took a course. And uh, so she was my copy editor. And then we went to a, a lady in Arizona who puts everything together, the pictures, the book. She turns it all into Amazon. And a couple of months later, you got a, You got a book online. So all, all three of your books done on the Amazon platform? Yes, sir. Okay. And here's the one, because we, we had a, a phone conversation one day. You were out hiking, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> audio book. Are all three yes, audio books or just uh, solved? The first problems? two. Right now, we're working on just getting things set up to do the third for audio book. And so, to all, our, and all the fellow authors here, if you haven't done audio books, please think about it, because... People look online for those and uh, price them low and then people, more people will buy them. And to this day, I'm still selling the first two uh, on, online like that. So I know, I know a young woman that's a, an entrepreneur here in Pittsburgh. She just wrote a book titled This Better Work. And she was <laughs> going into a studio. She was going to pay $40 an hour. The fellow that owned the studio just said, turn this button and that. And that's that's it. So you, you read your own book? After I wrote it? Yes. You, you did the audio recording? Oh, yeah. No, I did. Yeah, I'm just too yes. cheap. I, I, I tried to get a hold of Tom Selleck, but he was too busy. So I just read it myself. I was too cheap. But wait a second. How, like, the, your books are not small books. Your books are over no. 200 pages. Yes, sir. How long did it take to record the, the, your books? <laughs> That's a good question. I never clocked it, Ken. Uh, it was a long, it was 20 plus hours. Oh my God. We did it over a period of time. Right. And I just had, I had some experience with those, those, uh, that program, you know, your ah, or yeah. stumble over words or ah, sh like that. They can take all that out of there. So don't forget lip smacking. Yes. Well, 
I, and, and also uh, dropping pages on the on the ground. I know that one too. So that too, yeah. And then like Jim talks about working with Barnes and Noble. I call it Barnes and not so noble because they, we had so much trouble with them just trying to get uh, a local Barnes and Noble shop to even get us through the front door just to have a book signing. It was right. Hey, I'm, I'm glad somebody else has had success with those. Well, uh, never mind. No descriptors here. Yeah, the that, opinions you may hear, the opinions you may hear on this program are not necessarily those of the Veterans Breakfast Club, <laughs> which might want to pursue Barnes and Noble as a sponsor. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Barnes and not so noble. We, well, we got that. We got that one. So, but you, because look, but you're this thing. This might have gotten must have gotten a lot of attention from the media saying. When, when you were on before, there were Vietnam veterans who were in country that put in the chat. They never heard of this, the SOG, and they had been in country. Right. So when, when you came out with this non-disclosure, did people go, you wrote a book about this? This is amazing. In other words, did you get media attention from your unique experience? Uh, minimal. Only, uh, well, I worked at a newspaper in uh, California, so... Mm -hmm. um, when the first two books came out, we did have some coverage there, but it was because I was there, people were familiar with it. We had a fair book review and uh, it was mostly positive. So you can't complain about that, but no, uh, we did the independent route. Um, after real war stories went out of business, um, we've just been on my own since. Okay. Um, by the way, just go back to the economics here. So if your book, what does your, what does solve? What the, the first book, what does it sell for right now? What's the list? It's $24.95 for the paperback and the ebook is $3.29. And how much is the audio book? Oh, that's a good question. Um, because they set the price on that, not 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 the author. Amazon set the price on that? I believe so. Oh, okay. The, that's, well, that's news to me. That's interesting then. So yeah. but they, they're not taking a printing cost, of course. So you just get what, 70%? royalty um no it's, it's not that high but uh we do get a percentage if you sign an exclusive exclusivity agreement with them for five years i think it's five or seven so you know uh particularly since the podcast started the the first jocko podcast began in june of 2019 since then i could never have handled the book sale volume and I'm glad it was Amazon because they have those printing presses set up where uh, they're selling uh, 20 to 30 books a day. And um, particularly after the po each podcast. So right. I can never oh. do that kind of volume. So I'm willing to trade off the fact that I don't have the time or the, the money or the patience to pack a thousand books and try to ship them all or 10 for that matter. Do, do you know where your books are? Do you know where your books are actually printed? No, they're all over the country. Uh, when they sometimes we've had a couple of book orders. We had a book signing out here last year, and when I first got to Tennessee, and the books came in from different parts of the country. Because I'm not, I, I don't know how they do it, but the books come in, they're paperback, right, and they come through clean, not not outstanding publishing or publication, but clean enough that people can read them. And oh, no, I think, I think, uh, you know, Jim show and I, uh, I don't know if it's where his book was printed or not there. My, my books are printed either in Tampa, Florida or Lexington, Kentucky. Oh, okay. Um, and, anyway, but listen, um, and brother, are you going to the, the Saul, uh, conference next week? No, in two weeks. The, the reunion. Yes, sir. Reunion. You're, You're going. Big. Okay. I, yeah, I'm I just have it's the Special Operations Association. I'm I was the president from 2011 to 14. Right. Then following that, there's going to be the Special Forces Association reunion, both at the Orleans in Vegas from uh, the 18th through the 26th. How many soldiers were involved in, in SOG? In eight years. And over eight years, it was over around 2,000. And out of the 2,000 that were assigned to SOG, depending on what author you talk to, between 800 to 1200 went across the fence on missions. Right. And don't forget, there's two other things. We had the highest casualty rate of war. Our casualty rate exceeded 100%. And today, 
there are still 50 Green Berets that are listed as missing in action in Laos from the 1,583 Americans still missing in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. And that's in addition to 83 aviators who died supporting us on those missions in Laos and Cambodia. So wait, so I guess 1,500 uh, soldiers still MIA, 50 of them were in SOG. Correct. Is that what you're saying? And okay. From missions in, in Laos and Cambodia. And don't forget the aviators. We're, right. I'm alive today thanks to the courage of the aviators, helicopter pilots, et cetera, and my Vietnamese team members. Wow. But listen, uh, I'm going to thank you. Thank Jim yes, and John. I hope you're still on the call. But I have um, – <laughs> Uh, Jim has a question or comment. No, just one comment. You talked about you talked about the Green Beret movie. I was actually at Dong Swai, which is the camp in the movie that's attacked right. with gun, and they save everything. And that is absolutely nothing like what happened. Yeah, there's a graphic <laughs> novel, and, and and I mean, it was nothing like it at all. Right. And and, and uh, you know, all I can say is when John Wayne movies, our district team would get a, a film a week, and when John Wayne movies were showed up, it was like Mystery Science Theater three thousand. <laughs> made as they were going on. John Wayne was not a hero, whether he was in the army or in the uh, driving cattle. Um, Did you meet the camp commander, Joe Stringham, Captain Joe Stringham there? No, I, I was there in 71. They pulled the 18 out oh, at the end of no, 69. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the first MAT team went in 70. I was there in 71. And then yes, I was sir. the last MAT member when I left. They were all gone. Oh, wow. Listen, I, I have one uh, closing statement and then two qu questions for... Uh, John and Jim, and I think John Barber left a call, unfortunately. Um, I'll send him an email, but- um, He had a hot day. Off, the, the, the statement is, you know, it's great to write this. We were talking about this before. I think somebody mentioned it. Future generations now know this, this history. And, um, you know, I, I once met a young lady that said that her grandfather was in World War II. And I said, was he in Europe or um, South Pacific? She didn't know. Something as simple as that, right? But now that we have Amazon publishing um, the, the ability to record audio histories, we should all be doing this. So to Jim and John, have, have any veterans come up to you and said, oh, I wanna write a book, or I'm thinking about writing a book. Have, have there, anybody ever asked advice on how to write a book? I, one, one of the one person that found me, I, I have a video out there on Matt Teams, and he found me and contacted me. He had actually written a book and published 15 or 20 copies for his family. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he didn't want to make it public. And I asked, actually encouraged him to write the thing and push it on Amazon. He's currently doing that because I said, this is things that needs to know. And he goes through his entire army tour, OCS at Benning. In fact, we were comparing notes. I was in the, I was in the, in the 6th Battalion. He was in the 9th Battalion. We had stories about how bad the 9th Battalion was. He had stories about how bad the 6th Battalion was. It turned out we were both bad. And so um, and, and, and so, so he's doing that. But but no, it, it, writing is not something people people do willingly. It, it, it's, it, it's something that they really have to want to do. And, and I think one way to motivate that is, is your great grandkids knowing more about you. And John, you're going to be going to this reunion. I've, I've got to imagine, like, do, do other SOG um, veterans say, how do I write a book? Well, over, over the last 20 years, ever since Across the Fence came out, I've had inquiries from people. I could, I could safely say that I've talked to at least a dozen men that have gone back to write books off of the experience. Uh, a few of our guys, like Nick Brockhouse, did a book, We Few, and that's based on his combat experiences. There are other guys. Lynn Black did one, uh, Whiskey Fox Trot Tango. So I encourage other people to write their stories. Like what Jim is saying is he's point on. It's, you know, you got to get your story down, if for nothing else, for your family and future generations who are going to come back and say, what did granddad do in the war? And we had some guys that have done fiction. And I've helped anybody that wants to do the history. I try to help them where I can. Uh, you know, it only has 24 hours in a day, but I always encourage people to go forward with it. John, um, exit question to you. Anything in the pipeline? I know you've got the podcast going on. Anything else? Uh, Saul Chronicles uh, Volume 2? Yes, sir. Uh, but that won't start until January. We've got a couple more reunions coming up. There's going to be a couple of SOG symposiums coming up in the next couple of months. So we'll be working with them down at Fort Bragg and then the reunions and then possibly uh, doing more of our, our SOG cast. Right. 
And then I'm going to, uh, around January 3rd or 4th, get serious about really looking at the uh, next book. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm a little slow. I just got SolCast. I just understand the meaning of it now. So it's, uh, <laughs> that's very witty. At least you got and, there, Ken. Yeah, I got there. Okay. And the other thing <laughs> is you're, you're making a point that I always make. you got to set your life up to write. So you're, you're getting the reun reunions behind you, holidays, et cetera. You know, you're going to get serious in January. So I, I appreciate that. Um, Jim, anything in the pipeline, writing-wise? If, if COVID treats 2022 like it does 2021, maybe my time from the time <laughs> the guy said he was from Mars at basic training uh, through, through, through getting on the plane to go to Vietnam, maybe. If I can find enough crazy stories, but those memories don't seem to want to come back very well. <laughs> okay, so listen, I gotta uh, uh, thank you again for uh, uh, coming here, and um, you know, hope to see both of you guys on more um, more of the Zoom, more of the uh, BBC calls. And, and I enjoyed know, everybody people, else's stories. Thank you for putting us together. We got to get more you. more people on these calls to to you know take uh, pen to paper. Yeah. And I see a couple people who are taking pen to paper who, who have taken it. Leo West, um, Korean era, Korean War era veteran. I know you've written your story, Leo, wonderfully. Tom Stein is working on a book um, about a, a man that he knew, an incredible story from a World War II story from Europe. Um, Mr. Masters, Mary Klepper, you're literary kind of people. Don Nemchek, how have you not written stories? Shame on you, Don. That's interesting you say that, Todd, because uh, Ken and I have been uh, discussing that. Uh, I think when a winter comes and the uh, doldrums of the season yes. uh, come upon me, I'm going to start uh, compiling some of my Good. thoughts, and I'm going to start in short story form. And uh, I I'd rather do an audio, of course, but I'm going to I'm going to uh, do the outline and and go through the motions, if you will, of the short story. I'm I'm excited to do that because I think it's. It's in me, I know. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm more of a verbal person than a written person, but uh, I know Ken's going to help me and uh, there'll be some others out there. So uh, interesting you ask that. But uh, this was a great program, not only for those of us who think we're going to write or will write. It's just uh, just interesting to hear the uh, stories about from Jim and uh, John uh, of their uh, experiences in getting these books together. So I really compliment Ken and, of course, you, Todd, for getting this together for us. And just, I know just one closing thing, Todd, and that, that, that basically is the beauty of the short story is you don't have any character development. You don't have any plot. You don't have any timing. Mm -hmm. Basically, you've got a short story, then you go on to something else. It, it, it simplifies the writing process tremendously. Absolutely. I agree. You have a, a, a simple short story with a beginning and an end, and you write that, and that's how you start. And usually the process of writing that story will remind you of another story that happened um i see that beth feather has a question here beth you could ask it yourself if, if you'd like to unmute uh you said how do i take letters from my dad navy i guess a navy world war ii vet and grandfather world war one and put them in a book form just thinking about it beth absolutely that is something that you know somebody like me as a historian would so value reading those letters yeah, I would like somebody's advice because I've got binders of letters that are the originals and I've, I've looked at it going, what should I do with this? I mean, my grandfather in World War I and my dad in World War II, neither one of them saw combat, but they wrote letters back and forth all the time about what they were experiencing, where they were in, in those particular areas. And a lot of it too is, um, you know, what was happening at home kind of thing so i don't know if it's real quality material it's not about pearl harbor or anything like that but just wondering what to do with them don them check yeah beth uh, as i put in the chat room if you haven't gotten the chance to read it yet there's a book written by lisa spar it's called world war ii radio heroes and what she did beth was she found in her grandfather's uh, belongings after he passed his letters uh, and uh, others um, during World War II when he was a POW. They were eventually uh, also transmitted through ham radio operators. It's quite a book. Uh, take a look at it. It might give you some inspiration. And I know Lisa personally. She's a stand-up woman, uh, perhaps even contacting her 
she may give you some tips as well. So that might be a starting point for you. Jim, okay. Roberts? There was, there was a book recently published on Amazon. Uh, a, 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 a district intel agent in another district, not, he wasn't where I was, was there when I was there. He, he used manifold paper, which is, you know, carbon paper. And he copied every letter that he wrote home because he typed, I don't know how he had time to type a letter. But he just took those copies and digitized them and put them in a book and sold them. You know, some of them you can't even read. And, and apparently we've sold a number of them on Amazon. So people are, you know, you, you, you're putting out information. You're not putting out a piece of artwork. And, and so, you know, if you can get it into a form that people can read, I think you'll find people would just just really enjoy seeing what was said. And there is something called the Center for American War Letters at Chapman University. I'm putting the link here in the on the Zoom side in the chat. Um, and I do believe that they have an open call for war letters. Is that, is that donating them, Todd, or what does that I mean? think it's, uh, yeah, I think they want donations. Okay. Hey, Todd, I just want to make one comment about letters. Um, you know, here in Pittsburgh, our 31st Street Bridge is actually named William Raymond Prom Bridge, 20 year old Marine killed in action, Medal of Honor recipient. And th one of our bike rides is going to be out to the Doughboy statue in Millville, then over the William Prom Bridge. But if I read an article in something like this. If he was in Vietnam for 120 days, he wrote 70 letters home. You know, he, he just was a prolific letter, right. uh, letter writer. So. And there's also the a Andrew Carroll. Okay, that is the same thing. It's now at Chapman University. It was uh, called the, the War Letters Project, and, and it sounds like Chapman has taken it. Uh, yeah, I think that would, be a, that would be a good place to at least look into. I would say, Beth, and then we'll go to Thomas and then Tom, at the very least, scan the letters to make them available so that you could you know, upload them to a website or something like that. Thomas. I was gonna comment, Todd, how uh, uh, to Beth here. Uh, I had a couple chapters in my book that I wrote that were uh, audio recordings. And I had, a, I had a, it came across my mind like, kind of like what you like, boy, how do I get these to pen and paper? One thing that I could probably suggest is um, get yourself a audio recorder and you read those letters into that audio recorder and then you can get a software online that will transcribe your uh, voice to paper and you can put it over on a Microsoft Word document now, a lot of it, you know, try to remember to speak very, very clear because a lot of the words won't come through, but the more slower and precise you are, it'll help you from doing your editing. Yeah, but that's one way you could get your letters to paper is just by the recorder, speak it and transcribe it. And you, it'll do a lot of the legwork for you because it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Trust me. It's and you'll know those letters, though. There's nothing like reading aloud. I everything Correct. I ever write, I read. My younger daughter said, when you're talking to yourself up in the attic, what are you saying? <laughs> I didn't realize she could hear me. Um, I, everything I write, I read out loud. And, and I find that it, I catch a lot of mistakes and I, it helps with the rhythm and the tempo. Tom Stein, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me, Todd. And thanks for another great uh, meeting. And, and gentlemen, thanks for sharing all your expertise. Uh, I'm at a distinct disadvantage because I'm a physician and nobody can read my writing. Um, so <laughs> I'm not sure where to start. And, and I do have to say to Julia, um, I wanted to thank you because I did wave to you at the Steelers game a couple weeks ago. And you waved back to me personally, way up in Section 536 in the nosebleed seat. It was very kind of you. <laughs> Um, what I did want to ask is, um, Todd has been kind enough to uh, read a couple of drafts of mine and uh, gave me some great direction. Um, I was wondering how many of you are willing to allow me to bounce things off of you. Um, I was in the Army for 38 years, and, and they ruined me because of all the classes between Officer Advanced and Cast Cubed and 
command and general staff and all that jazz, they always teach you subject, verb, you know, predicate and object, just like the nuns used to beat into me in Catholic school. But they don't teach you to write flowery, fancy, you know, prose and things like that. So when I write, uh, I've been accused of writing a, a phone book or an encyclopedia and not not a good, interesting story. And so I need somebody to wrap my knuckles with a ruler or something that would help me uh, write better. Um, so any any uh, input as to how to reach out to you without uh, dominating your time or or tying you up too much? How do we get in touch with you? Uh, I'll put my email in, in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Tom, your writing is extremely clear. Do not make it flowery. OK. <laughs> Don't make it flowery. No, it's more like hooking the reader. You, you know, you, when a reader... Unfortunately, especially nowadays, you, you have very little time to catch a reader's attention. And after a few sentences, the readers are wondering, why am I reading this? Why should I read this? You kind of have to give them a reason to keep on reading uh, when you start. Uh, and I am, coincidentally, Monday, I'm leaving to go to Belgium um, wow. to interview the, the primary sources before they're gone, before they're yeah. dead, uh, much to my wife's chagrin. And I'm going to spend two weeks over there interviewing as many people as I can, uh, you know, over the age of 80, uh, who actually Fantastic. were boots on ground. Um, the problem is they almost all speak French and I speak hardly English. So um, <laughs> I have to, the reason it's hard to do this via Zoom and other modalities is because of the translations and the timing and so on. So I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, but, and that's huge. But right now, I, one of my biggest problems is, the fidelity that I promised to these people, by the way, that it's an older Belgian couple who have a very special World War II museum in Belgium. It's called the We Remember Museum and uh, their mission in life. And they do it out of the kindness of their hearts. They make almost no money doing this. And, and the reason I'm writing the book is to get their word out and any proceeds to go to try to support and maintain the museum and keep it going after they're gone. But their primary mission is to make sure, especially Belgians, um, but in general, Europeans never forget the sacrifice America made to liberate them. And there's, it's not a, it's a museum full of stuff. You can see BARs and, and MG42s and Mausers and, and all that jazz, but they tell stories. They tell individual soldier stories by the dozens and hundreds. And it's a phenomenal uh, place to go if you get a chance to go. Um, it's the finest museum I think you've ever been to in terms of actually experiencing the war, uh, assuming uh, some of you guys already been in your own. And that's the other thing. I, I'm, like I said, I'm a physician. I, I plugged the holes. I didn't make them. So, um, you know, I, my stories would be relatively boring, to be honest. Um, so I'm telling somebody else's story instead. That's great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I, it's a wonderful story that you're writing. And I absolutely think it has an audience. And uh, so I encourage, I'm so glad that you're heading over there and, you know, get, yes. getting those interviews done before it's too late. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Ken, thank you so much for hosting this program. We have another one coming up in two weeks, do we not? We do, and it's going to be a unique one. We're going to have a, um, a guest that was uh, in such demand. We're going to bring him back, Thomas. Is he still on the call with us? I think Thomas dropped off. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. Well, he's coming back, so we can't speak poorly of him. He's coming back with uh, Carl Merlantis and um, John Arsenault. Um, they're, we're going to be talking about a book, which is right here on my bookshelf, uh, LZ Sitting Duck, and uh, the interesting story about Carl Merlantis. So, yeah, and you kind of glossed over Carl Merlantis. I mean, that's a pretty big name to have on a to have on our program. And just as an ironic thing, you know how our memories come back? I swear, I probably watched C-SPAN twice in my life. <laughs> Carl Melanchis was on C-SPAN. I watched him being interviewed. No, oh, he's the, big. The, the time he took to write this, how long it took the book to be written and published is tremendous. So uh, he, wrote, he wrote a novel called Matterhorn that came out yes. in 2010. It's one of the great uh, works of fiction about to come out of the Vietnam War. He is truly, I mean, up there with Tim O'Brien and Philip Caputo. I mean, you know, no disrespect to the people on this on this call, but the, um, you know, one of the greatest uh, Vietnam War veteran writers that we have. And I'm just 
thrilled and surprised that he's uh, going to come on our program in two weeks. Somehow you pulled that off, Ken. Thank you. Thank Thomas, who's, who just left here. <laughs> he's, he's going to the uh, air show in Houston, so maybe he had to pack and go. But in closing, I just want to say this, because I always say I teach a writing class and I teach people how to train your brain to think that a, the way a writer does. And I think everybody should be taking steps to do that. So in two weeks when we reconvene, maybe everybody will be a, a few steps down the road to, you know, to, to enhance their writing abilities. Thank you so much, Ken. And I, I hope everybody has a good Friday and a good weekend. I'll see you all Monday night, October 11th, when we have a group of guests from Japan, from Kaiten Kai, a memorial that remembers the Kaiten, the kamikaze, the underwater kamikazes from World War II. We're going to have people who are who keep the memory of the Kaiten pilots, as they were called. They were kamikaze pilots alive. Many of them were friends or, or family members of Kaiten pilots. Should be a wonderful program. I'll see you all. Take care. Good night, everyone.